notice I just used the cover of applause to try and blow my nose. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yeah, but everybody looked anyway, because like, purr, purr, you know, so. <laughs> And with that strange interlude, thank you, Brian. <laughs> Could I please ask Francesca Murphy to come and read what she's done for today? Strange interlude. Thank you, Will. Um, Dylan Thomas, I think, is one of those poets that everybody knows, even if they've never read a poem in their life, or the last one they read was beaten into them in school. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, this is called Legacy. Stumbling along the mumbles mile, the more we sank, the more our spirits flew. We were all poets and deep thinkers, three pubs in, honed by wild nights and the golden barley brew. We talked about how many musicians, cats, and children carry your name, and how you were a dozen years too late to join the 27 Club, and yet you're still an honorary member. Is this how we remember you? by following your winding trail through New York and falling off our stools dead drunk at 3.30 in the afternoon. Your words whirl in the air around our heads, trickle through mountain streams. They burn in the fire, deepest red, settle and sink into the earth, elemental, experimental, your words on the page, in the mouths of others, are a corporeal—I couldn't say this word—corporeal testament to be touched and tasted. All that time wasted, lamented and mourned, all that work unwritten, unread, all those words unlistened, unsaid. The life becomes a legend, the legend a myth. And the truth has so many sides. A tangled history of endings and beginnings. Ride the white horse to St. Vincent's with a broken legacy of saintings and sinnings. Repatriation, remembrance, struggle and loss, white cross and soft green hills at St. Martin's. Hard Westminster marble ringing underfoot, crushed between Byron and Elliot still singing like the sea. And beating in our blood the rhythms of the language, the leap and drop of syllables and silence, rush out across the landscape searching for sanctuary and settle in our ears like a weary fox. Voices, faces, familiar places, dreams and thoughts and motivations, inner worlds and complications, sun rises and sets on our expectations. Night must fall. But the stars are out. Thank you, Tom. Um, taken to the stars, and now we're going to be taken not to Swindon, but somewhere by a man from Swindon, mm -hmm. and his name is Clive Roseman. I'm not from Swindon, I only live there. Okay. <laughs> um, right, I've got two poems. Um, the second one will be the Dylan Thomas one. The first one is just one of my own. It's called Jeremy. What happens when a decent, honest politician gets a whiff of power? We've never had to know. It's always been a rhetorical question about a mythological creature, a metaphorical allusion to something non-existent, like the Loch Ness Monster, or a witness having a blood transfusion. That's now changed. We know the ugly answers to an age-old conundrum, because it's happened. The status quo is rattled, a man has emerged who believes in a better way, and truly means the things he says. So the vested interests feel unsettled, go into battle with weapons of power and prejudice, he must be stopped, discredited, 
crushed at all costs, so they smear him in sheet and hope the masses fall for it. But try defacing gold like this, it still retains its worth. It doesn't fall in value as if it had been cursed, just as wrapping it in a suit and tie won't make its value higher. It hasn't gone away or turned to lead. No matter what the vandals said, it can be cleaned, will gleam as good as new, and an ever-growing crowd will see, as those who lie and cheat to keep control complete begin to drain in the pools of propaganda they've been pissing. With step one taken by a landslide, step two was harder to define, with so-called colleagues in fear of losing influence, committing acts of treachery in league with those we all supposed were on the other side. But we won't be lied to all the time, and whatever the fat cats may proclaim, there is an appetite for change. And the second one is simply called Dylan. When I was young, my mine of knowledge was shallow, and the arrow of my ignorance misled my mind to confusion, led me to many false conclusions, like the only great Dylan was Zimmerman. How could I be so ignorant? Now I'm older, wiser, my knowledge is a little wider, and I'm here to salute a genius. I say we drink to Dylan, I think he would agree with us. I like a drink, and think it's probably true, an alcoholic is someone you don't like who drinks as much as you do. But today, I'm sober and I'm serious. I'm standing upright, as any artist should. Booze probably wouldn't allow me to do that, but I was positive drinking milk would. <laughs> Dylan Thomas died too young, yet left an awesome legacy. I could continue with a eulogy, but I think it's fair to leave it there. You see, someone is boring me, and yes, I think it's me. Thank you. Thank you, Clive, who lives in, but is not from. <laughs> Thank you. <Swindon. laughs> and uh, the next reader is the philosophical body poet known as Fran Smith. So. Yeah, I like to think about bodies. <laughs> and my first poem is one about the body, uh, and it's about how the body responds to toxins, and particularly alcohol, but drugs. Uh, it's based on traditional Chinese medicine and the way the meridians work in the body, so I'm actually linking the meridians with the muscles and the uh, how the, uh, emotions will, will fire those uh, in the bodies, trying to detox itself. So this one uh, is uh, yeah, about excess toxins in the body and how that can come out with uh, too much drink and how somebody might be at the suffering end of that. It's called battered. Oh no, he's had too much to drink again. The fashion fades. The dragon flares and sees red. The kidneys try to cool and keep the balance. An ignored call for hydration. Water to dampen the fire within. The liver fails to cope. The spleen sends out its army of defences to fight and protect. The shoulders raise as the chest concave. <coughs> Triceps draw back, ready to attack. The biceps flex, then he'll vex and leave in tatters. Sometimes the one who matters. <laughs> My next poem is one that uh, I, I did write uh, to do with um, Dylan Thomas. Uh, I wrote it at the Dylan Thomas Centre doing a Villanelle workshop with uh, Jonathan Edwards. Most of my poetry is in free form, so to, to do a, a, a structured one was something different for me. Uh, and going on from anger, and when you have extreme anger, then you have rage. So uh, this is a call for peace and uh, treating each other well. Uh, I've called it the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, and the Hippocratic Oath, for those of you who don't know, it re requires a physician uh, when they become a, a doctor to swear by the healing gods of Greece to uphold ethical standards and not to do any harm or exploit an <coughs> ill person. 
uh, its values to promote trust and good behaviour and fairness and kindness and safety and security. So I think this poem is working on lots of levels in these days of uh, austerity and what's going on in the world and refugees and things. I think if everybody's a bit kinder to each other, the world would be a better place. The world is filled with too much self loath Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Shouldn't we all take the Hippocratic Oath? Though not by bread alone, but give us our loaf. The light has faded into a raging dark night. The world is filled with too much self loath World famine and greed, do you expect growth? Do not go gentle into that good night. Shouldn't we all take the Hippocratic Oath? People are starving and need a bread loaf. Find joy, joy in the rising of the light. The world is filled with too much self loaf Mix bread with lasoves for some fine toast and golden dawn for daylight that's bright. Shouldn't we all take the Hippocratic Oath? Do not go <coughs> gentle into that dark night like most, but find happiness and bliss for the coming of the light. The world is filled with too much self loath Shouldn't we all take the Hippocratic Oath?